Hey everyone, I'm Karen Walby Solomon, and welcome to What's IGN Crushing On, IGN Africa's official entertainment podcast. I'm your host, and I'm joined as always by my producer and editor Rebecca Barchers. So, this is a show where we discuss all things entertainment and pop culture with a new guest every week. We bring recommendations, news, and fun facts sometimes touching on the more serious issues surrounding these topics. Hey, welcome to episode two of season three. Today I'm joined with Taryn, joined with, joined by Taryn Stain. Hi Taryn, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm great. Taryn is an actor, um, producer, many, many things. She's also the host of Hope I Get It podcast. So how are you doing, Taryn? I'm good. I like I was telling you earlier, this is my second day back in the real world <laughs> after my 10, 12 day isolation. So I'm good. I feel, I feel like I have, um, I, I don't know. I just feel like a new person, I think. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, um, shame. Like, it's been like the worst. So, how, like, how has your year been? I mean, you, you, I can't even. Imagine. It's been, it's been. Well, twenty twenty. I don't even know what to say about that. Um, twenty twenty one. I was like, it's gonna be the year. I mm. felt hopeful. I was like, we're gonna get it together. Um, not only like in life, but I think I was like, the theaters will get back yeah. and go back to, back to work. Everything will feel normal again. Maybe, maybe not right at the beginning, but slowly, but it's like August already. <laughs> and I still feel like when, when, when is it happening? Mm. When is life going to go back to normal? It still feels like we're stuck in 2020. It's like and 2020. I I like in a rut. <laughs> yeah. 20, 2020 yes. continued. Yes. I mean, there's definitely been changes. There's been, obviously, our restrictions have lifted and mm. people are, you know, the, the vaccination rollout is happening. And so things are moving, but it still feels like, in my space anyway, it feels like things are still stuck. Mm. But you, you've because done... The industry. <laughs> but you've done a few plays and stuff during lockdown, like... Have you? Yes, I was I was able to so at the end of last year when our like heavy lockdown restrictions lifted, I was able to to film a short film and then I did a play which we filmed so that it could be okay. streamed. Mm. So we did that. I was able to do that. And then my podcast is honestly the one thing that's kept me going. Mm. It's kept me sane and it's kept me connected to to my community because mm. I felt like Everyone, everyone was obviously going through something, and I was, I realized I was, I was like, I don't have hobbies because mm. all I do is work. So I, I, when you're stuck at home, I was like, I, I don't have anything to do. I don't, I can't knit. I don't garden. I don't, I, I don't draw. I mean, you can only color in so much. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I need to find a way to still be creative, but stay connected to my community and to continue to network because when we come out of this, it'll be so nice to have a new. Uh, a new network of people from wherever. Hmm. So, so my podcast honestly has been like a saving grace for me. So, like, wh- uh, where did the idea come from to start, like, to start it and stuff? So, for me, I I listen to a lot of podcasts, hmm. and I was, and I'm always so inspired when people just do the things. Hmm. Like you, all of those people, I'm just like, look at her go, I love it. <laughs> so I, and then I was, I was listening to a lot of theater based podcasts and I um and I thought these are such interesting conversations but what's the one topic that I'm not hearing a lot of and it was auditions so the, my podcast is we share our stories from the audition room from the casting process that we all go through dealing with the rejection how we prepare for the audition um our best experiences in the room our worst experiences in the room and I just thought this is a way where I can engage with with my friends, with my colleagues, but this is also a way where I can network because me talking to person A will lead me to them introducing me to person B. So, so that's what that's mm. what uh, gave me the idea to start the podcast was just to have conversations that I wasn't hearing in the podcast that I was listening to. So, so how do you like? Okay, this might be like a long, like a 
long winded question, but like, how do you prepare for an audition? Because for me, like that, that would freak me the hell out. Like even high school plays, auditions were scary for me. I can't even imagine on the scale that you do it. They, I mean, they still are. Anyone who tells you that they aren't even just a little bit anxious is straight up lying to you. <laughs> um, but for for me, it's like um, every audition is different. So if it's a if it's a musical, I like to know the show that I'm auditioning mm. for. I don't need to necessarily know every song and every word in every song, but I want to know the themes in the show. I want to know the potential characters that I could play in the show. I want to be able to know the um, the style of the music in the show. And also a friend said to me, it's so important to know what was happening in the world mm. when that show was being created. Because theatre is a mirror to society. And what was happening in the world when something was being written, was being created. Mm. So something like Hamilton, for example, it's so it's like historical, mm. but it's so relevant to the political climate that the US was going through at the time when they were creating that mm. show. So it's so important to know things like that. Um, and then obviously, if it's a if it's a musical, I know I'm going to have a dance call. I try and get into a dance class because like I can move, but I'm not like a dancer. So I like to get into a dance class. Um, I prepare whatever the song is that I'm going to be singing and I go and see my singing teacher and for the rest, I just try to not get distracted by things before I go into that room. Um, like, it's very quick. To, everything is heightened. From the minute you wake up, everything is like, because it's today, mm. everything, like, and you, it's so quick to spiral. And um, when you get there, you're, like, you're in a waiting room with, like, 20, 30 other people. Yeah. And people are, like, kicking their legs up to here <laughs> and warming up their voices down there and all of that can it can unnerve mm. you so for me I my, put my earphones in and I just try to keep like my to center myself meditate mindfulness um and to, and also for me the main thing is to remember that whatever happens in that room doesn't make me less of a performer mm. it doesn't take away from my ability um whether it's good or bad whether I get the role or not um, it doesn't it doesn't make me less than when I walked in there mm. um, and it's important and also what I've what's really helped me is that to know that the people I'm auditioning for they they want me to be the best that I can be mm. they are not they, they they are rooting for me it's so easy to be there and be like I've got to prove to these people I have to defend myself I must <laughs> defend my talent I must go in there and but they want you they want you to be the best that you can be. They want to see the best. Mm. So, yeah, for me, that's basically how I prepare for an audition. And what are some of your favorite shows? Some of my favorite musicals. I love anything by Stephen Sondheim. Mm. Any, anything. Stephen Sondheim could put music to the phone book and I'd be like, <laughs> yes, bestseller. Yes. Give him all the Tony Awards. Everything. Um, so I love... I love Stephen Sondheim, but I'm also a big fan of, um, I, I, okay, I do like the big musicals at everyone. Mm. I'm always like, I don't want to be what everyone else is. So I'm always, but I do enjoy Hamilton very much. And I've been listening a lot to um, The Bridges of Madison County, Jason Robert Brown. It's such a beautiful score. And it's so emotional. And I don't know, maybe it's because I'm in emotional space. I don't know. But I was like, this is so beautiful. I love the song. Um and I am one of my favorite musicals is Anything Goes. It's it's old Cole Porter and mm. it's just so fun and there's great tap dancing. So those are but yeah, anything by Stephen Sondheim. I'm like, mm-hmm, this is a winner. <laughs> what what would your ideal role be? Like which character would you love to play? I would love to play Reno Sweeney in Anything Goes. I would love to play Reno Sweeney. And then I would I would really like to play Anyone, I'll play the couch in company. I love yeah. that musical so very much. And I, 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 I mean, I'll play the door, I'll play the couch, I'll play the birthday cake if I ask you. I just love that <laughs> musical so much that I, I would, I would even be the person in the wings just adding my voice. <laughs> so I would love, love to play anything in anything in company. Yeah, maybe Joanne when I'm when I'm older. 
It sounds amazing. So I was um so what have you been like watching recently that you've been enjoying? I have been and it's so bad because obviously I've been in isolation. Mm. In two days I binged five seasons of Younger. Here. Yeah. I started watching and I could not stop. I love that show so much <laughs> because it just well the episodes are they're twenty minutes, so mm, it's like okay. um and I just I love, it's set in New York City. It's my one of my favorite cities in the world. So I was like, I love this. The music that they use in the show. I'm sitting with my Shazam, like pause Shazam. Well, so isn't Sutton Foster in there? Yes. Yes, <laughs> she is. Um, and I just, and I just love, and a friend was saying to me, oh, it's on Showmax. Um, you should, you should watch it. So I was like, okay. Like, I, I, I think I, I tried to watch it a few years ago when it first came out. And I just, I don't know if I didn't have the time or I just couldn't get into it. Mm. But um, now I cannot stop. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like, I've got two seasons left. I'm so excited. Um, I also started to watch Ta- Tali's Babe. So what it was Tali's Wedding Diary. Yeah. And then Tali's Baby Diary. And I, <laughs> I think I watched both of them in two days. I could not, I witch cackle laughed. It was so funny. Um. <laughs> And I think it was funny because I know people who, yeah. who, who, it's who just, are Tali. <laughs> I had the same thing because, like, I put off watching it for years. Like, and I only watched the, I only watched it like this year as well when the second one came out. And I was like, nah, I know too many people. Like, this is gonna annoy me. But it was so funny. It was. It, <laughs> I, it is history. And I called my sister and I was like, you need to download the Showmax app. I'm gonna give you the password. You need to watch the show please and then I was watching and my mother came in and she was like what are you watching and I said you gotta see this and then she stayed and finished watching with her. I was like see it's so good it's just it's amazing it's so good and it's I just and I love that it's a South African show as well mm. because I think that it's such a it showcases not only the South African humor which is one of my favorites <laughs> But it showcases the the quality of entertainment that we that we are producing mm-hmm. here in South Africa. So I love that it's a fully South African show, um, and they weren't trying to be all American or yeah. anything like that. So I loved I loved that. Uh, what else have I been doing? I listen to a lot of music. So mm. I recently listened to Billie Eilish has a new album mm. that came out I think on Friday, mm-hmm. and honestly, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Not one song was a skip for me. I, it sounds so different from her other stuff. Um, it's 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 really beautiful, and the lyrics I think are incredibly powerful. Um, who else had a new album? A band called Bleachers, who I had never heard of until um, T- Taylor Swift collaborated with Jack Jack, and I'm gonna say his last name wrong. And and Ant- Ant- that's the one. <laughs> and um, I have a friend who's a big Bleachers. Fr- uh, she's a big Bleachers fan and I was like Mm-mm, okay, okay. and then he collaborated with Taylor Swift and I I love Taylor Swift and I loved the albums that came out mm-hmm. Folklore and the, the Evermore and um, when Bleachers came out I thought oh, let me listen and I think it also came out on Friday and it's really beautiful just beautiful I think my mm-hmm. taste in music is changing and I love that I'm all about evolving <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I wanted to I wanted to talk about um, about Love Is Blind because I saw you were also watching it, girl. Wow, <laughs> I have much to say about Love Is Blind. <laughs> so okay, let's start first. Uh, I don't even know where to start. Okay, let's start with with the biggest Damon Damien <clears throat> and Gianna. Damien. I. <sighs> So, and I was, I had this conversation with someone yesterday. So Damien, he looks like my ex <laughs> and he behaves like my ex. And so all I want to do is throw my shoe at the TV because Giannina, I cannot, I cannot understand how she allows herself to be <sighs> subjected to that kind of behavior. By someone and I and I think it's because I've been in that position myself so I'm just I'm like looking at my looking at her as me going what were you thinking what are you doing mm. um 
he has this mentality where he's like the victim. Yeah. And oh, you, oh, you. Um, <laughs> so okay, let's start with so Damien. First of all, inviting Francesca to the party the way that he did. Mm. Same. Is a, is, we see is, where it no. goes. Exactly. He 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 gave her the impression that it was a date, mm. and he gave her the impression that him and Janina weren't actually together. Yeah. That maybe they were on a break or whatever. And um, then when when he gets there and Janina walks in and he's like, oh, she looks so beautiful. She <laughs> takes my breath away. I was like, are you well? Because this girl, <laughs> this other girl is going to come up soon. And you, yeah, like, oh, she looks so beautiful. Take my breath away. And, <laughs> you know, quoting poetry. And then Francesca arrives and he's like, I just you know, I want you to meet my friends. Um, and it was just so wrong. Yeah, it's just the whole thing, and and then when when she con when Francesca confronted him and she said, um, what did she say? I should not have been brought here and spoken to like that. Mm. Um, he goes, no, you're right, and and that's <laughs> that's on Giannina. That's not on me. Yeah, my friend, that is on you because you invited this poor woman into this situation. She is here because you asked her to be there. Exactly. She's had this confrontation. Because you have put her in that position to have this confrontation. So it is on you. And then he gets all big to me and, um, with, Gian with Janina and he's like, um, don't tell me that I don't have a say. And I just, I, I, I can't, I, I cannot with Damien. He's just, he, he's, he is toxic personified. And he knows exactly what he's doing. This is what gets Absolutely. Him. Because he brought her there because he knew it'll make Gianna, G, 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 whatever, insecure. Absolutely. But how is he pulling up in the Porsche like, hey, beautiful, <laughs> get away from me, please. And he's like, I, Porsches okay. are right for me. How can he afford a Porsche and the Barnett well, can barely, can barely my, live? My cousin has a theory. She reckons he rented that Porsche for that scene. Mm, okay. That, that. I, I feel like <laughs> she's right. She's right. Driving around in a Porsche. Are you well? No. I, I, okay, can we talk about the Barnetts and how they he sold his house to pay for a student and now they're living in an apartment with her roommate? I'm like, how are you all struggling so hard? How, why do you not have, like... Do you know, and honestly, I think... What is his name? Matt. Yeah. I think that he is terrified of Amber. Mm. I, I think he is so scared of her. Um... And I don't, I actually don't know what that relationship dynamic is. Um, I feel, to be honest, I feel like a dry piece of toast has more personality than than, than Matt. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I think I, I think that he. I can't believe all those girls liked him. It makes sense. No this is what this is what I'm saying. I don't understand how Elsie, Amber, Jesus. Jess. I, I, I don't understand through a wall. <laughs> Through, that you can tell me that this man has something uh, no I'm sorry and um and I think I think that he was somebody who obviously was very independent he had his own house he kind mm. of had his stuff together yeah and then and but like did you hear when she pulled up at the house oh my god it's so tiny <gasps> ma'am you live in a flat <laughs> this man has his own house I don't care if the house is the size of a matchbox. The man has his own house. And he was living there alone, wasn't he? Oh, no, he had a roommate. I think he had a roommate. Did he? No, maybe not. No, it was just him and the dog. Yes. And and he that he sold... Yo, that, I mean, that was a gamble. Mm. You know? Not only was he in the show and that the experiment was a gamble, but I think that was a gamble where he sold his house to pay off her loans, which, of course, is very noble mm. and... Um, and if anyone would like to do that for me, that's great. Um, but but I feel like that's a gamble, especially because I feel like Amber's very unpredictable. Yeah, and and you can see that he has lost himself mm. in that relationship. Um, like when he said to Jessica, um, "I'm not, not allowed, allowed to. to talk to you." Oh, like. She's, she's so controlling that she is telling him who he's allowed to talk to. And just for me, I feel like, and even even when they were at his parents' house, 
she dominates the conversation yeah. she dominates everything and i just feel like he he's obviously too weak to i think um, he kind of wants to go along you know he wants somebody who would mm-hmm. take the lead i think that's what he wants that's why he kind of likes what he likes about her is that he doesn't have to take the lead he can just she probably said why don't we sell your house and yeah. pay off my student loans and he's like sure you know what <laughs> yeah uh, you, so you you know you're probably right he is probably somebody who doesn't make like um doesn't like making hard decisions mm. who isn't probably emotionally mature enough to make those decisions yeah. um to be like you know the head of the house or the or or to kind of or maybe he just feels intimidated and that he can't be her equal in the relationship mm. which is unfortunate for them um but i just i think she is I, I, I'm not a fan of Amber. I never was mm. from the beginning. I was not a fan of her. There's just something she's incredibly forceful and, um, but in in a way that is off putting. Yeah. Um, it's fine to, 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 to be very sure of who you are and very sure of, of your, um, your ideas and your ideals. Mm. And that's fine. But I think that she, She's in a way where she doesn't even re- leave room for anybody else's opinion to be yeah. heard, which was evident with her going off on Diamond. But also, she has a very like pick me type energy. Like she, like even if yeah. you, even when Bonnet said, "Oh no, all of her friends like him," he mentioned all of your friends would leave their girlfriends and wives for me, which means she doesn't have female friends. Yeah, so she's definitely somebody who thrives yeah. in male, um, in male, in male company and you know i have i have i have friends who are like that they are they are more comfortable with a male energy Mm -hmm. and that's a hundred percent um okay but i feel like amber is destructive when it comes to female um friendships or female energies she 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 doesn't like being like with people who are the same gender that she is she wants to be she wants to be the one that's the different yeah. one. She wants to be the one that's yeah. She she, she gives me that like energy. Who, yeah, like who tear da- who tears down other women? Like that's just like the type of person yes. that she is. Like you, she probably yeah. shit to, like she was talking shit about Elsie all the time to Mark, and <laughs> like you know that was probably all the time. And the fact that she was there defending him. Mm. And I mean, she, and she was like defending him. <laughs> I, I, I was shocked. And okay, if if Elsie's also in the, in the wrong, then she's in the wrong. But she completely did not acknowledge anything that Mark did that was wrong. As far as she was concerned, everything Mark did was yeah. right, and Mark was right. And and I and I think that is, and I think she's destructive in that way. Hmm. No, definitely. And like I was also like they like she made like Jessica like got naked on top of Bonnie. Like she just said to him, she was drunk and she just like I mean I understand that she probably wanted to, but all she did was say to him, like, Are you sure about your decision? And I was like, Yes, okay, like you can feel disrespected, but like don't make like she like she's like she went above and beyond to break us up. Like <laughs> the girl made exactly. a oh, once. And also, the question Jessica asked, I mean, maybe the way she went about it is mm-hmm. the wrong way. But I also would ask, if somebody came and was like, I met this person through a wall, I'm getting married. I would also <laughs> be like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, and, and maybe Jessica observed the two of them together that maybe the dynamic in the relationship is not it's not one of equal. Mm. That it's very much, it's Amber's way or there's no way. Yeah. Um, if Amber says the sky is green today, then the sky is green today. And no one is going to say that actually the sky is blue. Um, so, and so if I had witnessed that, and I think Jessica did feel that Bonnet was a friend. Mm. And if I witnessed that in a friend, I would also say, are you sure? And perhaps maybe not be a sloppy drunk about it, which I think Jessica was at the time when she asked him. Yeah. Um, I don't think, so I, I guess that it came across as, you know, but also I think Amber took it out of, it's been two years later and she's still like, I don't want the gift. <laughs> I don't want the gift. 
I don't know. I I did not. Um, like it just was like, what? Are, what is wrong with you? I will take that Tiffany. Should they could use that Tiffany champagne glasses. Sold it. You know, put it towards their house, baby fund, whatever. Something. Look, if I don't want the Tiffany champagne glasses, I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, me too. You know, <laughs> let me know. Let me know where to collect it. Um, but I feel that yes, I feel that Amber. I think she is someone who wants to be. Um, she wants to be the center of of everything. Mm. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because you, you there's there's other people to consider. And yeah. I think her her marriage is. She is the center of her marriage. I'm married. I'm married. I'm married. I'm married. <laughs> Who are you, Emma, are you married to yourself or what is happening here? Because I'm very, I'm very confused <laughs> by this dynamic. And also like how she, um, she, like you can also, see, like what I noticed is that you can see that a lot of the girls are still friends with each other. Like Gianna and all of them, but you never yes. see her with the other girls. Like, the, like um, Matt hangs out with the other guys, but you never see her. Like she's it's, clearly exactly. not friends with them. Yeah. Um, like even Jessica, even though she lives in California, when she came back to, to Atlanta, they went for lunch. Yeah. Um, Diamond and Lauren obviously see each other all the time, but you're right. Amber was never there. Like the boys all work out together Mm. and Amber's just, what is she? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what to tell you because I I feel like if she's not the one who everything is revolving around in Mm -hmm. that moment, then she doesn't want to be part of that. And of course, if you like the only girl in your friendship circle of boys, of course, there's like natural instincts to be like protect the girl in our group yeah. to, um, you know, to make sure that the girl in the group is taken care of. Um, and I th- and I, she loves that. She obviously mm-hmm. she 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 feeds on that type of of what's the word I'm looking for of that type of thing for for herself. Yeah. No, definitely. Shame. Shame. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see what's going to happen in another two years or so. <laughs> I hope they keep bringing it back. Yeah. I hope they keep being like two years later. <laughs> I saw somebody said, uh, uh, so, so one of the South Africans on Twitter was like, "When I'm so glad that they only bring it back once a year because we can't deal with this much chaos more than once a year. It's too much. <laughs> it is too much. I think that, what did we get? Three new episodes. Yeah. yeah. And it's like 45 minutes an episode. And it's just chaos. <laughs> chaos reigns in my life. And I'm trying to choose a life of peace. <laughs> I'm trying to wake up every morning and choose peace and mindfulness. <laughs> but there's just chaos everywhere. I do love it though. I do love it. <laughs> and I will say this to Jessica, if you are listening, I just want to tell you, I am very sorry. Yeah. That. For the whole of 2020, Jessica, who was 34, I'm sorry that I made you the villain. And that Mark, who was 24, I made him out to be the nice guy. Because he Mm. is the villain in this whole thing. And that is all I have to say about that. And I'm sorry, Jess. I'm sorry. (laughs) Same. um, So, like, also on the topic of couples, we have a little bit of time left. But I want... um, so Ben Affleck and Jayla went official. <laughs> it's beautiful. It so beautiful. what are your views on Benefit 2.0? Do you know what? Jennifer Lopez, I love her very much. Yeah. And you know what? She's 52 years old and she so believes in finding her happily ever after. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I love that for her so much. And I love that. She... She's like, okay, so my marriage, my marriage just didn't work. Okay, my engagements didn't work. That's fine. I will never give up on finding my fairy tale ending, my happily ever after. And I think that's really beautiful. She's always, she always leans in, and she's always like giving like love a yeah. second chance. And I love that. I love that. It's it would have been so easy for her to be like, I'm done. I'm gonna be a bitter old woman for the rest of mm-hmm. my life. Um, and she and I, I really love that. And I loved Benefer in when you know when they were in the beginning. What was it, 2012 or something like that? I think it was 2000, I think it was way before that, like 2001. Oh wow, okay. I think cool. it was like uh, okay, maybe not then, like two, 2000, like that time, like it early. Was, it was a long, and I I loved them. Um, the one thing I will say about Ben Affleck though, he always morphs into the aesthetic of the woman that he's with. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which. <laughs> Okay, Ben, that's cool. If you don't have your own aesthetic, that's cool. But um, Jennifer Lopez has 100% made him 
better looking. I don't know what it's, it is. My, my friend said to understand. me, I can't his understand. beard grows differently when he's with her even. And that's true. <laughs> Look at Ben last year. <laughs> Look at Ben last year. Look at Ben now. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's growth. It's beautiful. <laughs> Even, even look at Ben when he dated Jen the first time around. His hair was like combed. Yeah. It was like like a 1950s style. He had like a little fake tan going on. Like he was looking good. I was like, Ben Affleck, good morning, good day. <laughs> and then after, I think after his divorce from Jennifer Garner, he also just was like letting it go. You know, he let himself go. Mm. Um, but now, because Jen is super, um, yeah. super self care. She's like, she, like a hair. It is like never a hair out of place. She looks good, um, and I think I think she's someone who um, who's obviously feels good and then looks good. Mm. Um, she made Ben look good. But my friend was like, his beard grows differently. I was like, it's true. Look at this. <laughs> it is true. Like it's it's growing in a way that's like, mm, hi. Um, but I love and I and I love that she was like Instagram official yeah. on my own time. I, like, I will tell you when I'm And it'll be the official. last picture in a slideshow. Yes. So I had to go through all these pictures of being like, oh my god, can I look like this at 52? Wow, 52. Wow, come for me. Okay. Hello. Benefer 2.0. I love it. I really do. Like they do, they both look so happy. Like, yeah. I'm, and it feels and like she, it's the right time for both of them. There's yes, no pressure. And you, exactly. And and I think that their time apart, they have both been married and raised children mm. and have had all this life experience and all this growth and maturity um, and experience that I think it makes you go into a new relationship with 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 more insight and yeah and they obviously know each other very well um and so and she, but i think they know themselves very well now mm. i think i think they've had time to to know who they are and like i think jennifer knows who she is and what she will stand for and what she will not stand for mm. um and i think i think ben adds to that <laughs> so i love i love that i i'm, I'm all for I would like that pink ring to make a reappearance. Oh, that's a ring. I, I dream about that ring at night, Dad. And like, I <laughs> My sister had, I think, like, there used to be this thing, I don't know if it's still around, honey jewelry. Yes. <laughs> and my mother used to sell honey. And my sister saw this pink ring in the honey book. And I, I actually, I wore it for Mama Chick Dom. And so, because it was like, Ben, of her, like, Ben had given her this pink diamond mm. and my sister bought this like fake costume jewelry <laughs> ring walking around all of like grade 10 with this ring on her finger like she was the one <laughs> but yes i do dream of that pink ring i want that pink ring to make a reappearance oh uh, you know that will be like like no one could script that better than if they did that i think, I think the internet might. would break i feel the like it they... would break I feel like they might do it just for just to cause chaos. That two Leos together is like ultimate chaos. And like it's Leo, it's Leo season right now. So I know it's all, just like we live for it. <laughs> I, I'm just like this is two of them to, and then she announces it during Leo season. I mean, obviously it was a birth, and like it was just perfect, like everything. If there's one thing about Jennifer Lopez, she knows exactly what she's doing mm. at all times she is very smart like that very very smart no i love her <laughs> I, I i wish them well jen and ben if you're listening i wish you guys well we are here for you we support you <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> so it's you on that note i have to um segue into the next interview and we'll be back for crashing on so the next interview, we'll be chat. Well, I'll be chatting to Mark Lottering um, <laughs> about about comedy and his journey and all of that. So yeah, we'll chat to you again after that. So how are you? How has this year been for you? Um, this year has been well. You know. I can't talk about this year without 
referring to last year because they mm. kind of slid. The one slid into the other in terms of what we all are going through. Um, and I have to admit, I was so... Because um, my brain's always going crazy with, with um, you know, with creativity. So when this happened, I was like, oh, wow, um, this has never happened in the world before and I've got to write some stuff about this. So I, I think I was so consumed by... Um, the fact that we were going through this strange time that I didn't really experience it in terms of the calamity that it is. Mm. I, was, I was so sidetracked by having to, um, you know, because there, there was just um, this, this new thing about lockdown and how we are living now and the pandemic. And, um, and I was consumed with, with, with that and the challenge of having to move my stuff online that mm. I had to perform online because I had resisted that terrain for such a long time. And, um, and then that was weird. That came with its own weirdness because nobody prepared me for, for no audience. Um, yeah. you know, uh, my management was just, um, you know, we're going online and um, so they're going to film the show and we're going to do it live. And um, so get your material ready and get the show and we had the posters done. And we thought about everything mm. except no audience. <laughs> so when we did the first show, which was called My Fellow South Africans, I was about to go into the, go onto stage, which is the room in the studio where, where the cameras mm. were. And um, so we in the other room, which we will call backstage. And my team was like, so excited because they said, oh my goodness me, 17,000 people are tuned in. And... We didn't realize at that point that that was a record and that that will never, ever happen again. We didn't realize that that was just weirdness and madness. And while they were talking to me, I couldn't actually focus because, you know, always before you go on this mm. anxiety in your stomach and everything and give two little excited farts. <laughs> and then um, it was 7.30 and I had to, um, well, I went on at 8 o'clock, Acoustic Element went on before me. They, um, they were doing, they were opening the show for me. And then there were these two camera guys. And the first line to every show that I do is, I wear my sickness. So, and normally when I do that, like 600 people shout mm. back, I wear. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm grand on it. I'm like, I wear my sickness. And just these two camera owners like looking at me, like going, oh, are you like, are you for sin or something? <laughs> I really think it's going to go back <laughs> to us. So, um, so that was a baptism of fire. And then along with that um, came the, the thing of, oh, wow, I've got to get new, used to a whole new way of working. And then that kind of took up a lot of my headspace and, you know, rising to these challenges. So we did a couple of shows. I think in total we've done four, four shows um, during this time, which, okay. which I had to do online. Some of them without an audience. And then I think the last two, we were allowed to have 50 people in. But this year, though, what is different from last year is that I've calmed down, you know, because I've accepted this situation as mm. a new kind of way things are going to be done for the next while or so. So I've calmed down and I've literally calmed down to a panic because with calming down, you, with accepting everything about how we're going to live and... Um, how things are going to be, you also have to accept, oh my goodness me, this thing of a theatre operating in a normal way is, that's going to take a long time. Mm. And, um, and with that, um, you know, I'm always in touch with people who are messaging me online through Facebook and Instagram. And with that, there, there are two schools of, of people out there. There are people who say, not going anywhere near groups of people. And then there are other people who go, I will absolutely not watch theater on a laptop. Mm. I have to come into a venue, even if you're only allowed 20 people, those are the diehards. So we've seen that when certain venues could open and we could allow um, 70 people in, for example, though, you know, those tickets would be sold in 20 minutes, in 30 minutes, because mm. there are those people who just have to put on their lipstick and <laughs> I understand them completely. They are like, you know, I think in their head, they're just going like, tack, you know, they've just got to, put on the earrings, 
Um, you know, put on the heels, get on your liquor jacket, and come what may, you've just got to go into a space where there are other people. Mm. Even if they two meters at the table, two meters away, you just have to be with other people and you have to laugh at comedy. You have to laugh with a stand-up comedian with other people in the room. And there are people who refuse to do it any other way. And I totally understand that. So this year has been weird for me because you, you, you realize that that's happening. Um, of course, your income is, is threatened completely mm -hmm. your way of life and things that you, because I used to be in this wonderful position whereby, um, you know, the bank manager will phone you very discreetly and go, how are you? And that usually means, yay. <laughs> Like, you know, we, we need something to be happening in this bank account. And I was, I was always in a great position because as a, as a comedian, you're able to phone, phone venues, book venues in Joburg, Durban, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, especially big support in the Eastern Cape. And you book these big theatres, put up your posters, and you go in, and you tour with your show. You can write one show and mm. tour with the same material the whole year per region, of course. And in, in that way, your rent is paid. In that way, um, you know, you can continue living. You can, I love coffee shops. You can continue going to coffee shops. You can continue helping your charities because I work with, with um, you know, I work with a particular charity in town of Mitchell's Plain. And, you know, it's important mm. that we keep things going, the, the soup kitchens and so forth. Uh, but now all of that was, uh, has been challenged. And, and what happens in lockdown is you write one show and you put it online Never mind the whole country, the whole world yeah. can log in. All the expats can log in and now enjoy the show with, the, with Cape Town from wherever they are in the world. But the thing is, the show is now out, the material is out. And the thing about South Africans, they, the only reason they've been supporting me for over 20 years is because all they ask is new material all the time. Mm. And now that's tricky because now it's, you know, you're writing a new show. In lockdown, I've had to write a new show, one new show every three months. Before lockdown, I would write one new show every 18 months. Sure. Oh so um, so it, is a, it is a crazy time. Um, but the challenge has been good because it also pushed me to... Look at me having a little one-way conversation. <laughs> <laughs> <It's also pushed. laughs> Sorry, man, I never get people to my house anymore. So that's okay. Well, I, this I, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, yeah, I've, we've got to rise to that, to that challenge. And, um, and it's also challenged me and taken me to places where I should have gone before lockdown, but now I have the time and I'm talking about film and television. Mm. So my head is geared that way as well. So talking Please about ask me to say something or ask me something. Like, just do your job for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> my job is to listen to you. I, um, talking about television, like, I feel like my earliest memory of you is on um, that sitcom that you did, like, in the 90s. What is it called? Yeah. <laughs> Big, o Big Oaks, no, is that what it's called? Oh, what a, oh, what a traumatic childhood you had, Karen. <laughs> um, that was so classic. I, I love that show. What do you mean? <laughs> okay. You okay. Can, I like to refer to it as an underground following. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, you under your double bunks. Um, the, the thing about television is... It's very specific. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you, um, you know, when you are seduced by it, because all we want to do is be on TV, um, especially in the 90s, because that would be the ticket to fame. And, um, and I, I think you, you, you start to grow up very quickly, or I did, because I did a few TV projects. And when, you know, when I would sit down and just be with myself and think about what I'm up to, I had to realize that the live theater mm. is my most comfortable space. Mm. That is actually my calling. And I'm that creature, um, like so many other people in the world, I think that when you do get out into television, you must be with such a solid team who understands you so well 
because they've got to put you onto that camera and you're going to be in everybody's homes, but you have to be portrayed in the right way. It's got to capture mm. you in the right way because the very gifted people, and I'm not very gifted when it comes to TV, but the naturals, you can give them an A4 page and you can turn the camera on and they just work. Um, now, I need, I, I need very specific words um, I need to tell very specific stories because mm. I also have to respect my brand, you know, and, and I can't suddenly be something else on TV when somebody who's been supporting me all the years with VHS tapes and coming to the Baxter Theatre or coming to the Theatre at Monte Cassino in Joburg. And they support you all the years and then they see you on TV and suddenly you're this very different person mm. and you're doing a very different kind of of comedy and people kind of feel uh, betrayed and they feel a little bit disappointed because they've also told their friends, come watch, this is, this is Mark who I told you about. Mm. And then you're a different person. So for me, what I've learned is now uh, when I go onto television is I make sure that I've got the right team with me and that's the right director, the right script. The script is so important, um, the right people around me because people think you know, and it's not, I'm just, not just speaking for myself. It happens mm. to a lot of people, a lot of artists out there. Somebody sees you and they think they know you. They see the big hair, they hear the accent and they go, we've got the perfect script for you. I mean, we must put you on TV and you read their script and their first word is, Zay. And I'm like, I really seldom walk around saying Zay. You know, very, very seldom. Or they often, you know, I've had more than one role where somebody's wanted me to play um, where the character is called Herschel. Because then I realized that a lot of white people were exposed to like Herschel Gibbs. Mm. And then they heard that he was colored and then they, the name of Herschel is just like, you know, oh, that must be a colored name. So you find that people know so little about you and it's not their fault. Mm. It's just the assumption, and I think it's part of our journey. It's no matter what color you are, it's part of your journey in life to to um, not necessarily educate. Educate sounds so like you're putting your hands on your hips and like you're telling somebody, but it is part of your journey to 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 when you open your door and you let people into your life. Um, you have to let them get an honest glimpse into your life so that they can experience it. You mm. know, because we all we all want to be portrayed with dignity. We all have different stories to tell. Nobody is just one thing. So, um, so when it comes to television, it's a dangerous medium because as I said, you're going into people's homes, you're in the lounge and there it is. And that's the way um, millions of people are going to see you. It's the only way they're going to see you because there are millions of people who don't come to the mm. theater. So, that's the only way. so you've got to be so cautious. So I've been, I've met along the way now in the last 10 years, um, I've met the right people. There are many like-minded people like me who, um, who have the same issues. And so there are like-minded producers and there are like-minded mm. directors and like-minded script writers. And as you can see now in, in South Africa, um, the film industry, I'm so excited about it. We're seeing mm. lots of films from so many groups of people um, that you, you, know, you would not have seen it 10 years ago. And the directorial team and everybody is, is they, they're all in on it. Yeah. And it's being told from the inside, you don't have to sit at home and cringe. Um, I do <laughs> cringe with one or two because that's part of my life. I think it's very really hard to cringe. Yeah, know, same. Let's do that. <laughs> but um, but I'm, I'm so excited. Mm. Um, and it's all about this thing about telling our own stories. And after all these years, um, you know, so many, so many, so many years, you still see the stuff coming up in Hollywood now, mm. you know, with the Oscars, with, with um, you know, how many people are up there who are not white. Yeah. And suddenly, um, and, and they're dealing with the issues now. So this is a real thing that I'm talking about. Mm. Um, you know, so it's about um, empowering the right people and, and, and just telling our stories. I mean, I watch, I watch stories now, I watch films now, and I'm so, it takes me, it's got to be really good because it takes me the first 20 minutes, I'm looking on the screen for people who are not white. Mm. 
because we just become so accustomed to it. And, and you know, I'll tell you the classic line. Some of my best friends really are white. Um, <laughs> so this is not an anti-white thing, you know. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm just saying that, that it's a natural thing for us as yeah. human beings, for black people and white people, to want to see yourself portrayed in the arts. Mm. Um, and that's when you relate to a story. And we've got to make conscious efforts to change our thinking and the way that we tell stories. So I am excited and I hope to dabble on that side of the number line. So like, I also think like for too often I colored people in on TV and in film were like the butt of the jokes. And I think with, especially with your comedy, you sort of change it around where it feels more like, you know, we're laughing, like they're laughing with us instead of at us. So was that important for you to kind of like create that sort of, you know, like direction? It's absolutely important for me because um, whether you like it or not, and I'll just put it out there officially, I don't like being called a spokesperson or a representative, Mm -hmm. um, you know, of people from the Cape Flats. But whether I like it or not, I have the microphone. And people walk into the theatre um, let's say there's normally 650 people in the theater. I've got the microphone. There's a sold out audience sitting. The lights are me because I always make sure that the lighting is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> lighting is everything. You do laughing, but the lights will even guide you out to laugh. So even if you don't like a show, you go like, yo, but the lighting. So, um, so the lighting's great. There you stand with the microphone and whether you want to be called a representative or not, or whether you have an issue with being called a spokesperson or not, there you are. And the people who are sitting in the audience who come from the areas in which I grew up, they sit there and, um, you know, especially with my early work, they love you, but there's a little bit of, um, oh, Yana Mark, don't screw this up mm. because now it's a mixed audience. And the, it's such a fine line between having the joke at the expense of people from the Cape Flats. Mm. Um, because it comes when you get that microphone, it does come with some kind of responsibility. So yes, that kind of thinking impacts upon my writing in a big way. Um, and even when I portray my characters, you know, I've got a character who exists on a taxi and he's a taxi gachi. Mm. I've got a character who, um, she's a cashier. Um, and when you look at characters like that, even when you look at, at Auntie Moe's who's kind of, one of the more famous characters, and she's a housewife, but she says it from a freestanding house in Valgravia Road, Athlo. And these little things mm-hmm. um, are so very important, and you will be so shocked. Um, you know, to this day, so sometimes I go out and somebody will come up to me, and it's somebody who's not from the Cape Flats, and they will go, Ooh, um, you know, and they want to talk to me about how much they love Auntie Mo. And they say, I love your tea lady character. And you go, in that moment, you realize how much work has to be done. Mm. Because there are still some people who can't hear a Cape Flats accent without calling it a tea lady. Mm. You know, and if you tell Auntie Mo that she was a tea lady, <laughs> um, I might have mercy. You know, she, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of things that she would tell you. So, um, so there, there, there's so much work to be done and there's so much responsibility that comes with the work as well. And it definitely does. I, I am aware of the responsibility of it. Mm. And I do, um, you know, the, the, by the time the show gets to the stage, especially if it's in its second week, um, I would say of running in the good old days when we had long runs in the theatre, like two years ago. You, um, you, you make sure that every, even if it looks off the cuff, but every segment of the show is thought through. Certainly my performances mm. have been thought through, it's been interrogated. Most of my shows are produced by Anna McKay, he's directed some of them as well, and he's a hectic interrogator of issues. Um, so we make sure that when it goes out there, we understand where it's coming from and that everything is placed, um, you know, very delicately. At the end of the day, people need to laugh. That's my job. They mm. must laugh. But there's a responsibility that comes with it. So how do you deal with, like, people always coming up to you? Like, I, I'm sorry, like, you, you are, like, so recognizable. 
that I'm sure that it's like constantly like, how do you go to the shops? How do you do anything? I go to the shops in the morning because people are in a very good mood before 12 o'clock in the afternoon. They're very nice. Um, I don't know what happens after 12, but things happen. I think people's exes phone them or <laughs> they, <laughs> they realize that the magic is working. Or, but things like register, it's not so lick at the office and they're going to get another job. But generally, they're getting into the day. So... Um, so when you see people be, before 12 in the day, everybody's very respectful and everybody's mm. really decent. So we leaving today. It's going to be a beautiful day today. So <laughs> the rest of my life. So in that vibe. Um, so if I need to get things done, I, I go out early. But if I don't go out, you know, if I'm by lass or anything and I went out with my children and I can only go out after lunchtime, I, um, I find that people are are generally friendly. I don't mind being bothered at all. Um, you know, somebody told me once, the, um, someone who's in the industry said to me, you know, the, the, the time you should panic is when nobody comes up to you. Um, you know, that's when mm. you really should panic. So being a comedian, when people see you, um, most of them generally is a huge smile. Mm. You know, and so that's the interaction that I have with people. And it's always, it's very really brief. Um, some people will ask for selfies. Um, the voice notes are a bit crazy. People will say, just, just tell my wife something funny. And I'm like, you, you save your own marriage. Don't make it my problem. But, um, but generally people are, are, are really, really nice. The weirdest people are the ones that come up to me and they go, we watched your show on Showmax last night. And then silence, because now he was waiting for him to say, and it was amazing. <laughs> oh, and then I'm just like, okay, let me go and find out, find out with Andy. Andy is, I can't stand here in this hour. Just look at you, <laughs> watch my show and say nothing. So um, so the interactions are great. And, mm. and I think, I mean, uh, I'm in a great position whereby most of the time um, I make people feel good. And, and that sort of is my mission as, as a comedian. When people leave the theatre, um, yeah, you, you, know, you want people to think a little bit about stuff and about issues, but I ultimately realise that the only reason they've gone to the box office and dropped some cash is because life is hectic, many things are not affordable, but they've taken they had 120 rand and they decided mm. that they want to laugh. And you must never lose sight of that. That's what they came in for. Mm. What up and coming comedians would like, are you a fan of now? Um, it's always very tricky. I see, a, I see a lot of funny people. I see a mm. lot of funny comedians. Um, and particularly in Joburg. Um, but I don't, because I'm constantly working. What I found, what I found out in the past was when I was, when I was working and I watched other comedians, it was bad for me because I'm creating work and you don't want to put yourself in a position mm. where an idea is so appealing to you, um, that you find yourself using the same mm. idea, um, on stage. So... Because I'm always working and I, I, I never get to see um, a whole lot of comedy. But you, will, you won't get it out of me to single people out. Um, because I did that before and I got into a whole lot of trouble. Okay. But, what, but, what, I, will, but what I will say is, um, you know, I, I just wish that the newer people can, could, could start the way we started with the pressure, because when I started, it was me and, and David Cow, um, Alan Committee at that time. Um, and we used to, we just believed that we had to book a theatre and do like at least 60 minutes. So these were the days before comedy clubs. So the pressure was on to write new material. Mm. And now we have comedy clubs and you, you know, you come in and you're doing seven minutes or 10 minutes, um, which is great. But my problem is that people, um, you know, as I said, South Africans are, are crazy audiences. And when they don't hear new material, um, they get turned off. And the, 
the thing about our audiences um, is that your material doesn't necessarily have to be mind blowing. They just have a whole lot of respect that you made an effort to present some new material, even if you're mm -hmm. using some of the older stories on the night, but use some new stories. And, and so that has kind of been um, disappointing for me in that I'm finding that there's not a lot of pressure. Um, you know, there's not a lot of challenge being placed at the doors of the new, of the new people about this business of new material. And also I think with um, great success that we've had with certain comedians in our country and then with, with, with the biggest success story with Trevor having, you know, gone overseas and having his own show, is that the young comedians assume that it's, it's just instantaneously a rock and roll life. Um, but it's not. The way you get there is to, um, you know, the way you get there is to, 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 to develop yourself and your brand. And the way you develop your brand and the way you get your fan base to grow is to present the audience with new stories and to keep, you know, telling them funny new stories. So it's a long road. And I just think that now where we are at the moment, it's just too, too quick for some people in their heads because suddenly somebody sees a new comedian and suddenly, and I've seen this happen, um, a whole TV ad campaign is thrown at you. And then, wow, you know, the money's coming in and you're now with, with, with a particular brand and you've moved away from um, the, you know, the honesty of, of the life of the stand-up comedian and the, the, the passions of the life of a stand-up comedian and the sacrifices that you make and the, just the business of, of um, you know, of just keep compiling the material and playing with the material. And, you know, we've moved away from that. We're more now on about the rock and roll possibility of being a stand-up comedian. So um, I hope that we can kind of just get back to that place again where the younger people are encouraged, um, you know, about the earlier principles, which is worldwide, of, of, of stand-up comedy. So what do you have coming up? Um, I've got a show, my, my new show is called Loot. Mm. Um, and um, I think it opens in August. I must just check. All the details will be posted on my website, marklotting.com, because of, there's a venue in Durbanville called Dibur. It's an intimate venue. It's a supper venue where a lot of comedians and artists have been going for years. Um, and it's an intimate little venue, and they, they hope to be able to allow 50 people in by August. So they booked me in good faith. Um, and the, the show will be online, but it will be performed live at Dibur for mm. for. I think for a week. Um, so it's called Loot, and that's the show that I'm working on at the moment. Okay. This, this has been, yeah, the, it had another title. Um, <laughs> and then um, beginning of last week, boom, <laughs> so much went on when we saw people <laughs> trying to get um, big flat screens into their small getaway cars. I, and I, I did. Was like, yeah. I read your um your on your website your your like your blog post. You I was laughing about your whole story oh. about the man. Oh. The... Did you read that one? I'm yes. so glad. I'm so glad you were laughing. <laughs> it was brilliant. Okay, great. So yeah, so I want people to to um you know my new show is loot, but the the website that 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 you went to this is. It's been my website. Uh, my younger friends um, have met me and took me out for a strong cup of tea. And they said, we have to bring you into 2021, Mark. Um, Kanala, please, can we take charge of that website? And they revamped it completely. So it's being developed now. And that's the one that you've been to. Because my previous one, people couldn't even look at it on their phones because I had stuff from Noah's Ark on there and different kinds of apps. So now I bring it into 2021. And the idea with the website is that my fans, if they're feeling bored in the day and starved of any Mark Lottie material, they should be able to go there because we put up all our old movies up there for rent. Mm -hmm. um, so you can rent the films at like 30 rand and 40 rand. And um, we starting, we're launching at Ask Auntie Mo Corner, so Auntie Mo via video will respond to you. So if you write to me about your problems with your relationships 
and whatever, and then Auntie Mel will respond live with video. Um, so we can, we are and that'll be free for people just to go to and chill and relax. So we want the site eventually just to be like a go-to site. And the idea is to eventually to be able to put all the new stuff like loot. Um, you know, we want to be able to put it on there and people can actually just go there and rent the movies and run experiment with different things, mm. uh, talk shows and so forth on myblotting.com. So this, this ties in with your, when I allowed you to ask me one question, like four hours ago, <laughs> about, about, you know, how the year has been for me. Mm. It's that business of going in that direction. Um, I've been collaborating um, with, the, with the guys from Funny Cup. Um, and that's just been great in terms of guiding me, you know, in, mm. in, in terms of my online presence. So, um, so we, a lot of stuff we're going to experiment with, chat shows, little webcam series, and we want to put them with my webcam series. <laughs> 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 just a word I had in a meeting and they do it. So uh, we're going to put that on, on that marklotting.com site as well. So the new show will be at Deboot, and I'm sure it's August, but I'll put the details on on our website. Okay, Mark, thank you so much. This was lovely. Thank you. I sure I spoke a lot, eh? <laughs> um, so I could have gone on. Um, we have a time limit, but I could have gone on, so it's good. Okay. Thank, well, thank you very much. It was good. It was great chatting with you as well. We very, very easy to talk to you, so thank you. Uh, thanks. That was our interview with Mark Lottering. You can find him at Mark Lottering on Twitter and Instagram and at Mark Lottering on Facebook. You can also check out his website, marklottering.com, where you can find out more about his upcoming show, Loot. We will also post about it on our social media when it's, when the release dates are announced. Um, we would also read his like, little blog. It's so funny. Um, obviously, like, like, obviously, he writes brilliantly. But um, I, I, I read it quite often just to have a good chuckle. It's like his tweets, but longer. Like his Instagram captions, but longer. Um, but otherwise, if you need a little pick-me-up, read one of those today. Now we're going to our voice note reviews. This is where you guys send in recommendations or little notes of what you've enjoyed. And last week, we asked you to... To tell us about a rom-com recommendation, because technically this is releasing on my birthday and there's nothing I love more than a rom-com. So this week we have um, messages from Theo, from Zimmy, and from Najwa um, in that order. And you can hear what they recommend. So yeah, here's our voice notes. Hey Karen, it's Theo here. I just want to say you're really doing great work with the podcast. Um, to answer your question about rom-coms, um, my favorites include Always Be My Maybe, The Big Sick, Crazy Stupid Love, Two Weeks Notice, um, and The Lovebirds. There are also some LGBT ones such as um, The Thing About Harry, um, Love, Simon, and Happiest Season. Um, those are really cute. I would also recommend if you're looking for like a TV series, Love Victor. The first season was very PG because it was supposed to be on Disney Plus, but the second season was so much better. Um, but there are also some romantic dramas that I really recommend, and that's God's Own Country, um, The Way He Looks, Free Fall. That's a German movie, so um, you might just have to find the German translation. But they're just so many good romantic. Um, movies out there not enough like kind of modern rom-coms but um yeah i just really kind of like the feelings that rom-com gives you and it's just so wholesome and everything so yeah those are those are mine and i hope um i gave you some suggestions that you could maybe try out sometime hi zimmy here so my favorite rom-com has to be notting hill um all-time favorite i can watch it uh, I, I think i've watched it for over 15 times already um it got released when i was much younger but like now that i'm older wow um it's 
such a charming pleasant warm movie um you know the storyline of how you know two people come from different so societal backgrounds are just trying this thing of being in love and only now that i get to understand you know um of how it power really it is like just being out there trying to be fall in love with all these different people but unfortunately your background still stands you know your background still matters um so yeah um have a lovely day hi crushing on karen i'm not sure how i'm supposed to do this but my favorite rom-com is definitely a lot like love um firstly amanda peet and ashton kutcher love them together um, they have some such beautiful chemistry and then secondly i like the idea of a love story spanning over so many years you know you see you see their failures you see their growth you see them you know um being with other people and it's all it comes down to timing you know and yeah i enjoyed that i enjoyed them seeing different going to different cities I mean, he had to move back to his like mom's house at one point. So it was really awesome seeing young love turn into like adult love, but not forcing it when they were young, but realizing, you know, and also holding that space open and knowing they can always come back or not really that they can always come back, but they always found themselves coming back. So, yeah, I've watched that.